If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to James, James chapter 4. And as you're turning there, uh, remember again to pray for Brother Eric, Brother Junior, and Sister Diane as they battle the COVID and uh, the Lord would sustain them and make them well again. Uh, James chapter 4. Now, a lot of people says the epistle of James should not be in the Bible. It was disputed when they began to counsel how to put the Bible together. But I think the thing that irritates people about James is the fact that it calls for works. And people, uh, and it even suggests that your faith should be evaluated by your works. And I think that's what is the nudge of people, and it bothers them, but it, it's actually very good advice. Yeah. If, you, if, it doesn't, if your faith doesn't produce works in yeah. your life, you don't, you don't have much. So James chapter 4, in the first verse, the Bible says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not, hence, even from your lust that war in your members? You lust, and you have not. You kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain it. You fight in war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity against God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that now that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves before to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for all your goodness and watch care. We thank you for your protection here on the church at Dover. God, help our ministry that we might be well-pleasing unto you, Lord, that you would draw men unto yourselves according to your mercy and grace. This morning, we pray that we'd be able to see ourselves more clearly and you more clearly as well. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, James is a general epistle that went to more than one church. And so we have to assume if it went to more, more than one group of people, more than one church, that this was a pretty consistent problem. That it wasn't isolated to Corinth or it wasn't isolated over in Rome, that it went pretty much across the board. And it's given the name of its author rather than the recipient. And, and so we see he begins with some questions. And what I've seen among God's people, they would whole lot rather hear facts than questions. Because questions in and of themselves begin to conjure up things within you. Do I really have or, or possess what I think I do? Right. And because of that, we don't, we don't necessarily like them. So we ask them some questions, from whence, come among, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Now, uh, he was writing to a church, so the you is the group that they, they worshiped with, and he says, I want you to look and see where is that coming from? Now, everything, uh, every fight there ever has been had a reason behind it and something that sparked it up. And I don't know what, uh, uh, I've seen enough in churches to know it's usually just that way. Uh, a lot of times the devil will use one individual to spark the fire. And, and he says, so you need to look within yourselves and I believe individually as well as the group, look within yourself individually and see where the fighting begins. Come back not hence, even of your own lust. Now lust differs greatly from love. Lust is driven by carnality of man, and love becomes within the within the heart within the heart. And so we don't need to lust after things. Now we begin to think we understand lust because we think about 
nice cars and, and, and elegant homes and, and pretty women. But listen, that's not the lust he's speaking of. Just, be, you know, lust within God's people is this. Oh, she's more spiritual than I am. Oh, he has a better, he has a better presence about him. He preaches better than I do. And that is lust. You know what I have found with preachers over nearly 30 years of ministry is that it's not their ability, it's their personality. Hmm. In other words, my hair is black, going gray. I can't change that. I preach like I do because that's how the Lord made me. And I should not be critical of other people's preaching style. But you find that today, and more than criticism, you find people begin to actually be jealous over one of another. And so that's what he's saying here. <laughs> you have lust, not love. Lust that war in your members. And not members of a church, members of you. Members of the individual. Your mind, your body, your spirit. They're warring in there. Why? Because you're lust. Now let me say this, first of all, you will never ever satisfy the lust of this flesh, ever. Now everybody knows I wanted a 50, uh, <clears throat> early 50s truck since I was 16. And I love my truck, but now I notice when a vet passed me, the vets are looking pretty good too. You see what I'm saying? There is no satisfying this flesh. And, and that's what Paul, um, excuse me, that's what James was writing to the churches about. You're not going to fulfill the flesh ever. And that, that needs to be our understanding. Uh, even your lust that war in your members, ye lust and have not. That's what I'm saying. They'll never, ever be fulfilled. Your flesh, and listen, it doesn't have to be desiring a nice Corvette. It can be desiring more members than the church down the road. It can be desiring more uh, bigger conferences than the church down the road. He says you are lusting and that will never, ever, ever be satisfied. And so he says you, you need to think about it in, in more spiritual terms than you are. You lust and have not. You kill, now I do not believe this means they were killing one another. You kill and desire to have. I, I think it's going back to a fleshly thing. You know what? Uh, I'm not a big hunter, but if I shot a deer and dressed him out and hung him and put him away, I'd want a bigger deer next time. Uh, and, and something more impressive instead of a seven point, a ten point. See, you're not going to satisfy this flesh, even with religion. It, it, it is an impossible beast to satisfy. And that's exactly what the writer James was saying. You're not going to cure it. You lust and have not. You kill. And you still desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war and you have not because you ask not. Right. Now notice what he says. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. You ask in the wrong way. You ask the wrong thing. You know, uh, we are, are asking, our coming before the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't need to be a wish list of things that are really carnal to start with. Uh, even before food and drink, the salvation of your souls should take priority above all else. The salvation of your children and your grandchildren, that needs to come first. That, that is the priority. That is asking a mess. You know, give me a million dollars. You know what I found with money? He'll give you what you can handle. And you know what? Some of us are not just geared to, to be rich. And that's okay. And, but to see, the flesh will never see it as okay. They'll always see it as something, as a hindrance. So he, he tells this church, you're not understanding what blessings are about. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Again, not love, 
Not, 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 not to be fulfillment, but just on your flesh. Notice what he says, you adulterers and adulteresses. Now, I don't believe that they had any, uh, any, uh, relation like that going in their church, their, their adulterer was this world. Their, their affair was with this thing outside here. Their, their, their relationship that threatened their spirituality was what they loved about the here and now. That is an adulterous relationship, and God's children don't need to be in it. You know, if we are in singleness of mind to the Almighty... The adulterous affair will end. Mm -hmm. Now, what I have found in the modern day, that gets more attention than this. And dear friend, that's when it's adultery. I remember years ago, uh, Adam wanted to play Little League here in the county. And uh, they let him, even though he was a homeschooler, but practice was on Wednesday night. We had to say no. See, it had been very easy to, to get into that, and Adam was going to be pretty decent at it. But you know what? It would do him no good spiritually or us as a family to put our approval on that. What we would have been doing is committing adultery. Now, that's a very simplistic uh, uh, illustration, but it is what he's saying. They were in a relationship with the world. They were in a relationship that compromised them spiritually. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity or contrary or enemy with God. Now, you know, ever since I've been a preacher, I've preached against separation from this present evil world. This is the why. It would destroy you spiritually. Mm. Now, is it going to impact your salvation? No. But when you buddy up against the world, how can you possibly tell them of the goodness of Christ? Mm -hmm. How can you possibly tell them that, that He is the only life-changing force, the only salvation source in all the world when you're doing exactly like they're doing See, uh, that, that is the adulterous relationship. And, and as I see the uh, times go by, I see more and more churches that are aligning themselves with this. They have rock music and, and, and they have, oh, say this little prayer and all the junk that goes with it to pack the building out. And they're in an adulterous affair. They, they're in uh, a relationship with the world. Every day. Verse, uh, verse 5, excuse me. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Now notice that that's the natural man. He says that little, little as spirit, not meaning the soul of man, our nature lusteth to envy. We, we envy what other people have, do we not? Mm -hmm. Now all of you here have been to our home, little double wide, stuck on the hillside in Stewart County. Not much people are gonna lust after that, but <laughs> I've, drawn, I, I've driven by some homes I really wanted. <laughs> I lusted against it, and, and that's no bragging, at least I'll be honest about it. Me and Donna's dream home when we were young was a beautiful, dark red brick Cape Cod house with three dormers across the top of it. Uh, never got it. Again, uh, I have to say we didn't need it, right? Because God do it, does the very best for us. But it didn't change my desire. I, I still run by some houses, and that's nice. And he says, that's your nature. So when he saves us and makes us born again, he doesn't save that in, in, inside nature. And dear friend, it doesn't have to be toward things. It can be toward everything, even spirituality. Oh, there's, there's so much spiritual, you, you know, uh, so much more spiritual than I. You know when people become fake in their spirituality is when they're jealous of someone else. Now, I'm not a very vocal person when it comes to prayer, and most of you know that. 
uh, me and the Lord's time is spent a lot of, a lot of time just in silence. And, and, and I'm good with that. But if I saw, if I heard a beautiful prayer, you know, it'd be the, the, it'd be the envy of the flesh to jump in there and, and try to throw one out like Spartans, Charles Spurgeon, right? See, that's spiritual envy, is it not? That, and, and so he, as Paul is writing, I mean, excuse me, as James is writing this little epistle, he says, you have this problem in the churches. Notice verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. The remedy of the problem. Just submit yourself to God. And, and you know what? That is not a one-time event. That's a day-by-day, day, year by year, all through your life after you've been saved is submitting to God. Uh, one time won't do it. And the reason one time won't do it, and I don't mean redemption, that, that is salvation, but submitting to God is a daily experience. And listen, you know, I thought when I was a young man, by the time I was in my 50s, I'd have her whooped. If anything, it's worse now than it was when I was your age. Uh, that's not good news, is it? But uh, I'm being honest with you. And, and so the first thing that we need to do to battle this situation and to understand what our nature really is, just submit yourselves to God. How are you going to do it? I'll give you two ways. Number one, you get in this book, and this book will never lead you, lead you in the wrong direction. It says what it says. It means what it says. And if it gives you advice, go with it. Nice. That's submitting to God. The other thing is this. You seek, you seek the will of God in everything you do. You prayerfully seek God. And when He gives you an answer, even if it's not the answer you want, you go with it. Nice. The next thing he asks us almost seems uncomprehensible. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, you can't rebuke the devil and we'll, we'll see uh, if we have time that the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked the devil. That you're incapable of that. You know why he could rebuke the devil? Because he was God himself and sent him on his way. But, but we find James here gives us the challenge to resist the devil. And I believe if James gave the churches the, that challenge, that is within our ability. We can resist sin. We can resist worldliness. We can resist vanity if we're in the mind to do it. And so he tells us very clearly, you resist the devil. When he comes your way, you get... You, you stand your ground. You resist what Satan's influence is on you. Resist him. And you know what? I fully believe this. If you're in this book, you'll be able to resist him a lot better. You know what I have found with people that's taken over by sin? They don't spend a lot of time in this book. Yeah. Now, first thing I want you to know about Satan's attack, and again, for... For time's sake, we won't go there, but you all know it. Job chapter 1 and 2. First of all, Job wasn't necessarily doing anything wrong. I believe he, I believe he could have been more honest at times. Uh, it may be that my children had sinned. He knew what they were doing. You know what? The best thing you can do is be honest. And, uh, but besides that, we find that, uh, in fact, the Lord God said, there's none like him in the earth. The, 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 uh, uh, he worships me. And then Satan says, does he worship you for not? And we find that the attack happened, but every time it happened, Satan went to him for permission. Mm -hmm. Time and time and time again. Just remember whatever you're enduring, somehow God give it permission. Now, I have to say in the modern day, the modern Christian, including myself, probably Satan, the prince of devils, don't even take time with us. <laughs> we, he has enough imps out there to get the job done. 
And uh, I, I, it, it amazes me to think that he would, in, in, in such a slow, slothful generation, that he'd waste his time on any of us. But we find that Job was such of a character that uh, God said, have you considered him? Look how, look, look how much he loves me. Look how much he serves me. And then uh, Satan was given permission to go to him. So the next time you're battling something rough, just remember that God was in it. And you remember this, everybody wants to quote Romans uh, 28, uh, Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Remember this part, for those who are called according to his purpose. So everything that happens Somewhere in there is the purpose of God. Mm -hmm. Y'all yeah. remember when little Aaron lost his hand? How could we, how could we somehow say that was the will of God? But I have to believe this: something good's going to come out of that. And and so we find then that uh, when you're experiencing a trial, remember that God is in it. Now go with me, if you will, to Zechariah, tiny book of Zechariah. I just want to read one verse, and uh, I certainly don't mean to take it out of context, but I, I, want, you to, uh, I want you to see uh, what is happening there. I didn't write my verse down. Well, it says that uh, Joshua the priest, that the devil stood at his right hand to resist him. And um, it's in four, I think, three or four, but you can read it this week. But it said that the very man that was the leader, spiritual leader of Israel, that the devil stood. Now, what, what is the right hand? Now, if I am... Uh, Abigail is sitting at uh, Kenny's right hand. What can she do? Kenny, this is stupid. Let's go. Right? Just whisper in his ear. Or, I don't think you're doing anything right. So the right hand can be a good place or a bad. It can be give good things. Or bad things, can it not? Mm -hmm. uh, Joshua, what are you doing? You're leading people through the most rapid river in Israel, and you're expecting it to just to split open. What are you doing? See, that he'll question what. And, and the whole time, be sitting at your right hand and make you doubt God. Now, that's his purpose. That's what he does. And so we find that when we're looking at the ability of Satan, don't feel like you're exempt. Don't feel like you're outside his realm. Don't you feel like that he is not going to be able to touch you. Now, I believe as much as an individual could be saved in the, the way that we think about it in the Old Testament, certainly Joshua was an individual that, that, that was, but he wasn't exempt from the attack of Satan. And, and, and dear friend, you certainly are not either. You're not exempt just because you're saved. You will still experience those uh, attacks time and time again as you walk along with the things of the Lord. Now, uh, if you will, uh, very quickly go me to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and we're just going to hit a few verses in here. The Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 4. And we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Matthew, uh, chapter 4, in the first verse. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, I want you to notice two things. See, the Lord Jesus Christ, always in the will of God, always has been in the will of God, that him going into this wilderness place specifically to be tempted of the devil 
was the holy will of God. You know, a lot of times when people go through the, the thresher, I've heard people say, well, they must be doing something wrong. No, no, they may be in the very perfect will of God, and God has planned it out that way for his own glory and his own honor. That may be the, the making behind that. And so certainly we can't make assumptions. Here we have the sinless Son of God in a specific uh, situation to be tried uh, by Satan himself. Now, I want you to see that Satan did this because he was a, he knew the Christ Lord Jesus was certainly the cream of the crop. Um, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungered. Now, I, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the fast, for I really don't know. First of all, I know that the Lord Jesus Christ was a piece of the Godhead, and his, his flesh was a little bit... He was made in the likeness uh, of man. I'll, I'll put it that way. And secondly, I'll say this. I, I've known men to do juice fast for 40 days. So it's, it's not out of the capability of man uh, if you get water and, and, and that kind of thing. So it's certainly within the capable of the flesh that we're presently housed in. But I know after that, you would be very, very weak and shaky. You would have a difficult time. And when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. And when the tempter came, <coughs> excuse me, and when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, Command these bread, command, uh, command these stones to be made bread. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, uh, he questions the deity of Christ. Now, I think, and this, uh, the older I get, the one more I, un I, 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 un I don't understand Satan because he, no doubt, was an intelligent being. But he's still saying, and he's still questioning Christ even today, is he not? I, I don't see. He thinks he still will win. That he is so ignorant of the Word of God and the nature of the Almighty, he still thinks there's a chance out there. And, and certainly, as he attacks Satan, and, and Satan always does this. If what what does the word word if suggest? You question it. You know, if, if, if this pulpit holds me up, I'm questioning the strength of this platform, am I not? If. And, and so we see that anytime the Word of God is questioned, you can, you can guarantee the, the tempter will be there. Notice also in verse 3, it's, he's referred to there as the tempter. The tempter, can you do this? Now you do some... Uh, dumb things when you're dare now dare to and you're tempted to uh, Donna and, and, and Adam I guess are the only ones Sarah only ones left here that remember Jeff Moore he, he was with us for some time he was from over in the edge of Houston County and we always used to swim together at what's called Third Bridge and it's not there anymore it was a railroad bridge and it was it was about thirty three about thirty feet above the water, and the tempter says, "I'll dare you to jump off this bridge." Now the problem with Third Bridge is like most creeks in Stewart and Houston County, the water wasn't that deep. But off I went, and it, it, it worked out. It, it worked out. I, obviously, I'm still here today. But see, the tempter is going to make you do some stupid things. Uh, the tempter will always question the feasibility and the sufficiency of God. That is how the tempter approaches things. Verse 4, the Lord Jesus Christ answers him, but he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and saith to them, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall not give, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Very true statement. He, they did promise that. Verse 7. 
And Jesus saith in him, it is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil taketh him up into exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things I will give thee, if thou wilt bow down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt not Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And so I want you to notice two things. First of all, that uh, the Lord God always answered him with Scripture. And that, I think that's two things. First of all, you can't answer someone with Scripture if you don't know any Scripture. Right. And secondly, um, the Word of God is always sufficient. Mm -hmm. At your darkest hour, if you know that book, there'll, come, there'll be some encouragement come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then also I want you to see the Lord Jesus Christ said, get the hints. He, uh, he said, get out of here. Now that is an office for the Lord God. You don't have that ability. And a lot of people, you know, uh, mother was Pentecostal. And one time we were all down there and I, I wasn't there. I had a visit I had to go do. But Don and the kids and all were over at the little Pentecostal church, and uh, there, there was a group going to try to sing and play, and their equipment wouldn't work. And the woman said, get the doors open, and I'm going to get Satan out of here. Well, at the end of that extravaganza, the equipment still didn't work. You, you, you see what I'm saying? And we don't have that ability. It, it's not within us, but we can resist it. Yeah. We can't rebuke him, but we can resist him. And a lot of times, <clears throat> I think God's people don't remember the differences and, and the abilities, but we certainly can resist the devil. We do not have to get involved in his traps. Now go with me to uh, just a little further over Matthew 16. If you know your scriptures, um, the Lord Jesus Christ has just identified uh, by Peter as the living son of God. He was saying, I understand it. I know who you are. I praise you for who you are. But notice in 16 verse 21, Matthew 16 and verse 21, the Bible says this, from that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not come unto thee. But he turned and saith unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, that we just read in Matthew 16 where he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Understood the person of Christ. And three verses later, being rebuked by the Almighty. You know what that tells me? We can be wrong. You know, as a young man, young preacher, I thought I had the world by the tail. And now I realize how stupid I really was. And, and, and so we, we, we find that, that even God's men can be used. Now, I, I don't think that Peter was possessed of Satan, but I believe he's being used by him, don't you? Mm -hmm. You know, the will of God was this, that when Christ would come and would suffer death on our behalf. And Peter was trying to get in the way of that. That's a satanic action, is it not? Any time that we want to hinder the will of God, that's satanic. Now, I mean, as minuscule as it may seem to us, certainly that is something being used to try to, never will, but try to thwart the plan of God. And that's why Peter was identified this way. So I want you to see if Peter could be used in that method, dear friend, you can too. Uh, you certainly have the ha, have the composition to be used by the devil himself. Now, the Gospel of Luke, and th this is probably the most one of the most scary uh, verses in the Bible to me, and it isn't the only one that happened this way. 
Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 22 and verse 3. Gospel of Luke 22 and verse 3, the Bible says this, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, because of the, and be, being of the number of, being of the number of the twelve. Excuse me. Now, uh, if you do not believe demonic possession and Satan possession, you don't believe the Bible. You, you know what the Bible says concerning salvation? Ye are sealed to the day of redemption, correct? If that seal not, is not there, the door is wide open, is it not? How many devils was cast out of Mary Magdalene? Seven, right? You know what? Mary Magdalene was an elect. She was saved at some point, but until uh, until she was saved, she housed seven devils just in herself. Re remember uh, the lunatic, the, man the maniac of Gadara? How many did he have? We don't even know. We always say 2,000 because there were 2,000 uh, uh, pigs that died, but you know, that's just saying you don't know that there was only one in each one. It could have been 15 in each one. That, that, that's a very scary thought, isn't it? The reality that mankind can certainly be possessed of devils, and, and certainly that is what the Scriptures take and, uh, and teach. So I want you to see that not only satanic, uh, uh, satanic uh, <laughs> indwelling can happen, but demonic possession is, is just as real. Um, Acts chapter 5, very familiar verses of Scripture, but a lot of times I think we miss the meaning of it. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira were kicking up their heels. Uh, Acts chapter 5 in the very first verse. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now, uh, we know the rest of the story. Ananias died to his rebellion. But I, I want you to answer the question. Why has Satan filled thee? See, Ananias had a missing part, did he not? Because for Satan to fill him, the seal had not, the seal couldn't have been there, right? Um, Ananias was a lost man. He was in the church. He wanted to be seen. He wanted to be heard. Oh, I, I had a 40-acre farm and I sold it all and I'm giving it to Jesus. But he was lying. You know what? You do not lie to the Almighty and it lasts for very long. Yeah. And, and so we find then that, uh, that Ananias had the, he, had, uh, he was uh, open, if you will, to demonic possession, to satanic possession, and it certainly did, it did happen to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Paul, talking of his own self, talking of the, fra the frailness of his flesh, he says this event, this thing came on him, verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me or hinder me or slow me down lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, I want you to see that Satan here could not get inside of Peter because Peter was a saved man. But he sure could buffet him. Buffet means to stand in your way, to slow you down, to bring you down. Now, I've heard a lot of different theories on this and I kind of I kind of see one of them because he says, you see how big a script I write? Uh, it was probably vision. And I've had a lot of people down through the years, Larry, why are you so sick? 
Well, I guess it just wasn't going to make me. Um, you two haven't seen it, but the rest of them have. I, I've had a seizure standing right there and literally couldn't speak. Why does that happen? It, it's a buffet. Not that I'm going to be no Paul, but who knows what would happen if I didn't have it. Why is your kidney failing? Because that's the way God wants it. it, it it's just a buffet. And there has to be something good in it, all right? And so we find all down through our years that there are going to be things that come our way that buffet us, that Satan sends our way, that he uses to hinder us. But remember this, God, God allowed him, just like he did in the approach to Job, God, God allowed him to do that for, so for somehow, some way within that, God will be exalted. Always remember that. That's a buffet to our flesh, our flesh. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Now, I'm not experienced much of that in my life, but I have a little bit. Uh, uh, the building the little mission meets in at, Do uh, at Paris, that's the third choice. Uh, we, we had seven days to find somewhere to put this meeting in. And three different buildings fell through. You know what? That, that was Satan hindering. He wasn't going to stop us unless we let him. Right? But he could hinder us. He could put wall after wall after wall up. And dear friend, when he does that, if you know you have the mind of God, you jump over that wall, you cut a hole in it, you climb straight up it, whatever you need to do, you can get through it. Because that is a hindrance. Not an opposition. It's a hindrance to the mighty will of God. And sometimes I think we fail to see the difference. And you know what I've found? And, and this has been in my generation. And, and shame on us, 40 and 50 year old man. But if something don't just go boom, 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 give up. And, and you know, as good, sovereign, gracious, what we say, well, it just must not have been the will of God. Uh, you know what that is? That's an easy out. That's an easy out. And so we find that sometimes Satan does have the ability to hinder God's work. Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. Now if you know your Bible, you know this is the letters to the churches. Each of them had a great amount of problems. But I think this church specifically had some issues that were in and of to itself uh, because you don't, you don't find this said of the other churches. And to the, we'll read verse 12. And to the angel, and I've heard both stories on that, if it is angel or if it's pastor, they're translated in different ways. Either way, I will say this, if it is pastor, that puts double double responsibility on us. If it's an angelic being, uh, it's for them. And to the angel of the church at Pergamos, write these things, saith, saith he which have the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan seed is. Now, I want you to see that that's a, a very real statement that Satan can meet with God's people. Now, can he, can he get inside them? No, if they're redeemed, they, that's certainly an impossibility. But he can sure hinder us. I know where Satan's seat is. What if it was right here? Remember, and I think it's the next church. I know that wicked woman Jezebel who called herself a prophet, and yes, or not. See, he can come in in, in people too. He can be you people. He can use people just like puppets on a string. He's good at it. 
And so we find then, uh, I'd say two things out of that. First of all, you better know who you led in the church. Mm. And secondly, uh, be watchful. You, you know what a good shepherd is? He's watchful. And he sees problems coming. He says, hey, he needs to go to him and say, hey, this is a difficulty. There's not, you know, we're pretty low uh, numbers wise right now, but there's not a person that's left this congregation that I've had told this woman they're in trouble. Because you know why? I'm a shepherd. Uh, I know my people. And, and, and so we see that, we see then as the Lord's people that we certainly need to be aware of what's, what makes Satan operate. What, how he can hinder us. So how are you going to resist this? How, how are you going to stop this? Was there any way to stop my epilepsy? No. I mean, I have brain damage. You can't do nothing about that. How is I going to stop my kidney? That happened when I was three days old. Was there any intervention for that? No. But you know what? What I have found is this. Prayer works for me. I've told you many, many times this story. Uh, just days before my brain surgery. I was reading the Word of God because listen, you talk about having a skull cracked open and then digging around in there. Hey, that's no picnic. But I was reading over in uh, the book of, not Ruth, the other female book of Esther. And she said, if I perish, I perish. But, and, and listen, until you, until you come to that point, you don't know the peace of God. Mm -hmm. And I knew then, if I didn't get off of that table, that she would be all right, and she would be all right, and he would be all right, and God was enough to sustain him easily. At that time, we had, I can't remember Kelly and Andrew were with us or not. They were. So we had seven children. God's able. Is he not? So whatever way that he buffets you, give me, I'll give you this advice. Number one, identify him. You know, uh, in medicine, we can't do nothing for you until we identify the problem. And listen, a lot of stuff that we write off is nothing. It's nothing. As nothing is Satan doing his best. So if it's a health problem, if it's a spiritual problem, say, oh, that, that's Satan doing his thing. Because then once you identify the problem, so you can address it. Address it in that book that you're holding in your lap. Address it with prayer. Go to somebody. It don't have to be me. It's your pastor. Go to someone that you trust and say, hey, this is what Satan is doing to me right now. How can you help me? Can you, and if nothing else, uh, I'm not the greatest counselor, but I can pray with you. I can pray with you. I had a friend one time, and well, I, I'll say that story to him we're not recording, but listen, uh, I can't do a whole lot, but I can pray for you. No. And that's where we need to be. 